Hi, everybody. Um, so I actually was not scheduled until the third week, but as an organizer, um, we are basically the first person to replace somebody when there's a someone goes out. And um, ironic, um, the, 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 it's ironic that the person is out because of COVID, right? And um, I'll be talking about something related to our, our COVID testing technology. So I'm going to um, I'm going to talk about something uh, I think very different. Um, the kind of my first project like this and probably my only project like this in my career, uh, which is, I think, a very unique um, a unique experience um, that I had uh, and the, the rest of the team working on this uh, project. Um, and in some ways, it's actually uh, linked to a CGSI in many ways, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Um, and so uh, this, yeah, so this is project is about uh, t a testing technology, which we uh, developed and, and deployed at UCLA uh, over the last two years. Um, so I just want to kind of um, go back to April of, uh, you know, um, March and April of uh, 2020, if you remember. Um, so this is right around the time that we were canceling uh, CGSI 2020. Um, if you re remember that uh, testing was a real kind of mess, it was a real, it was a real mess at the time. Um, and, you know, the headlines uh, looked, looked like this, right? This was kind of, uh, you know, what went wrong, this is the, the, the New Yorker was, you know, you know, saying what went wrong. If you remember, there's all this, the CDC test that didn't work, and then the FDA was, you know, this is a big mess, right? Um, and then they're saying that, um, like, you know, COVID has been absurdly sluggish, that puts us at risk. Um, they're saying that Tom Hanks got sick in Australia where COVID testing was working, right? So this is a big deal. Um, and if you remember, I don't know if you remember this scandal, right? It's kind of funny to look at now, right? How NBA team got 58 tests, right? And, and that was a, that was a, a scandal um, in, the, in the national papers, right? Um, and it was so bad that uh, the state of California um, decided to uh, build a, their own facility for COVID testing at the cost of uh, 1.4 billion dollars, they built a, a facility uh, to do to do COVID testing. So it was that it was that serious of a problem. And so in this time, um, actually Jonathan, it's too bad that he had to step out. He was basically talking to us and said, "Hey, you know, we have a, first of all, you know, they, they, they we had a stay uh, stay at home order, so nobody everyone had to leave um, unless you were working on something related to COVID, right?" And uh, Jonathan said, hey, you know, we have all the equipment in our labs. Let's just go in and test, right? Why not? You know, why not, right? So Jonathan kind of got a group of us um, so, uh, to, to work on this. And, um, and so that's how this project really, really started. Um, and so, you know, if you think about uh, part of the reason why there were the problems was really that, um, well, we were asking to do, uh, the society had needs for testing on a scale that uh, never, you know, it was never, it was unprecedented uh, because we were asking, uh, like, we, we had a need to test people who were not sick, right? So all previous testing has focused on, you know, the relatively small percentage of people that are sick, but here now we're asking to test people who, everybody, right? So. It, it was a real, um, you know, the, the, like the, the, the issues was uh, scalability and infrastructure. And so the, and, and actually even today, um, although there were many, many um, attempts at developing uh, new technologies for COVID testing, the vast majority of COVID testing today is really done by this quantitative RT-PCR uh, technology, which is been the gold standard um, and in use for 20 years. And um, it, you know, it works pretty well, um, but it's, it's fundamentally uh, limited um, in, in several ways. Um, so, um, I mean, in general, you know, how do you like get that many samples, but also it requires uh, RNA purification, uh, which, is, which is typically a bottleneck. Um, and also, you know, every, qPCR machine it's one machine it can process you know a certain number of samples uh, you know in a couple hours um, which is great that's a good 
good turnout time, but you know, it's only scalable by how many machines you have. So the large testing centers are basically these giant farms of these machines. Um, and, and you know, obviously like, especially early on, the, the reagents for these machines, uh, for these tests were very limited. Um, and, and because, you know, it's like if you, to scale, you really need these machines and you need people pushing the button, you know, 24 hours a day, um, it, it, it can be expensive, right? Um, and so, and that's why when there are these surges, what happens is that, you know, they have a certain 24 hour capacity, but if you are beyond that, then you get this big backlog of samples. That's why some of the turnaround time gets around. So us coming from genomics really thought about this, you know, why do we need to use uh, qPCR when we have uh, sequencers, right? So why don't we try to develop a new technology using sequencing? So the idea, that's really how uh, SwabSeq uh, came out. And so um, the key, I would say, inventors of the technology are, are Val Arboleta, who, I don't know if she's here now, um, but she gave a talk on Tuesday evening, and uh, Josh Bloom, he's a, a scientist in Lena Krugex lab, and Sri Kasuri, who's um, a faculty on leave at a biotech. That, um, and so the, the real um, key ideas in SwapSeq is that it, it's, it's different in the sense that um, it adds a, it's based on sequencing, um, but you know the, and and but the key idea is that in the uh, PCR reaction, it adds a barcode to every sample, and so that barcode allows you to pool many many samples together, and then when you sequence them, you can use the barcodes to deconvolve the the sequences and figure out which uh, individual had which uh, you know had which. Um, 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 like which ones are, are, the, are the positive. So you get still individual level diagnoses. And so the key, and, and also because sequencing is generally more accurate than uh, PCR, you, you can, you don't need um, uh, RNA extraction. Um, and uh, that's because really because the, the readout is digital and not, um, not uh, fluorescent. So. Okay, so what, let me just say one more thing about the barcode. So what do I mean by a molecular barcode sample? So this is kind of a toy example. So let's say uh, you have an amplicon, which is uh, we're looking for a, a 10 base region on the S protein of, uh, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what we mean is by adding a barcode, we add to for every individual sample, we add kind of a unique piece of sequence um, and that's done in the PCR when it's amplified. And you can imagine that, so here's four different, you know, it's, it's obviously a toy example, four different samples, they add a different, um, different sequence. Um, and, and so then, you know, when, when the samples are then all pulled together and sequenced, <clears throat> you'll be able to read that part of the barcode to figure out which individual, you know, which reads came from which individual. And, th and that lets you, um, sequence, you know, potentially thousands of samples together um, because, uh, and, and that's where the efficiency comes in. So um, a, another a little detail, so um, the barcodes are actually part of the PCR primer that does the applica application. And, you know, uh, when you're doing PCR, you have a forward and reverse primer, and we have a different, kind of a unique barcode on each end, um, and this will actually become a little bit important. And um, and so, uh, so that, that's, that's the, the, the idea. Um, there's actually one more kind of um, technological idea uh, that is, turns out to be really important is that we also add in a, what's called a spike, which is a synthetic sample. So we, so we, we have the, the targets a 10 base sequence. Uh, what we do is we um, add something that looks like the target except for has uh, six of its positions reversed. Um, so, um, and we add a certain quantity of that to every sample. Um, that has the advantage of, <clears throat> um, first of all, um, you know, you'll, you'll always see it, right? That's one thing. But then the other, I, the other real advantage is, is that any artifact that'll be acting on, you know, the, the actual target sequence will also act on the spike sequence in the same way. Right? So for example, if you have PCR inhibition, it'll inhibit you know, both, both of those. And then your readout 
is going to be the ratio of the spike to the target. And so that's, that's and here's an example of, of uh, how, how that works. And so here is um, a plot showing, uh, this is typically a plot that you do for uh, limit of detection. So you have on the x-axis uh, samples with a different amount of uh, synthetic virus, no, no amount of synthetic virus um, inserted. So the, the blue side over here, um, it's kind of over, way over there where it says negatives, that's zero. So that's basically zero synthetic samples. So that's a negative sample. Um, and then as it, as it progresses to the right, you see the larger and larger numbers of, um, you know, you can, you can see that this, and, and, and the, and the uh, y-axis is the number of reads that you see of the target. Okay, so you clearly see a trend, right? So something's working, okay? But you also see a lot of noise. I don't know if you, could, you can, can see that. You see a lot of noise. Like, so for example, if these are all zero, this looks good down here. But what about some of these are kind of mixed in with these, right? And then you have some of these points over here, which, you know, so these are everything kind of in this region and up here. These are false positives and false negatives, right? Um, so that, that's, right? But uh, if you're just looking at the total counts, and that's because, you know, for example, here you, you have like some PCR inhibition, right? So you don't have a lot of reads, even though it's a positive sample. Um, but if you look at the ratio, it's much cleaner, right? So in the ratio, you see that a, there's a really good separation between you know, the positives and the negatives, right? So that, those are the two, two ideas. Um, and, and that gives you kind of a, an a accurate test. Um, and so, yeah, a little bit more details. So, um, so if you, if you, um, um, so, so this is, so basically what you observe from the, um, from the, from the sequencer, are basically are, are three quantities for every sample, which is the number of target reads you have, the number of uh, spike reads you are, and then also there's a control sequence in there, a human control. And so then you have this decision tree here, which is basically how you decide a sample. So if you see kind of enough, um, you know, to you have some derived quantities, which are the total, you know, if you have to see enough of the target and the spike, um, and then if you don't see enough, then it's an inconclusive because probably there's something bad with that sample. It may be the, the reaction could have failed um, or the sequencing failed for that well. Um, if you, it, but then if you, if you do see that and if the ratio is high, then it's a positive. And if the ratio is low, um, but you, if, you, if you don't see enough human uh, control, then it's, a, then it's an inconclusive. And otherwise, uh, it's a negative. So that that's you know it's a really simple, really simple kind of approach. Um, and when you okay, and so then we we evaluated this. This is all this is actually all done in in April, right? So very soon, you know, after uh, uh, well, we actually had we were able to work. They were able to work full time on this because there was really nothing else that was even allowed to be done, right? At the in the labs, right? So. Uh, but you know they showed that that that, that actually compared very favorably to um, existing technologies, um, and this is using for purified samples. This is kind of to be able to compare, and then the fact that it worked really well for purified technologies allowed us to look at unpurified samples. Well, unpurified samples means that you know instead of doing RNA extraction, you just heat the sample instead, and then and then run it. Um, so it's much more efficient. Um, it, you know it's not as good as the purified, but it's. It's good enough. So we show that it works fine for swabs, and it works uh, works pretty well for for saliva. So this is all um, in uh, April of uh, 2020, um, and uh, we went. I think we met like at the very beginning of May, maybe like May 5th or something like that. We met with um, uh, the dean and the president of the health system at UCLA, and we told them, you know, hey, we've solved. Uh, testing. <laughs> We've solved the testing problem. Um, we, we have a solution. Uh, we're ready to go. Uh, we, we have this stuff, right? So, uh, so they actually uh, re responded. They didn't like laugh and kick us out of their offices, right? So, um, uh, or the Zoom meeting at the time, of course. Um, but, you know, they were, they were, there's a lot of skepticism about 
actually moving something from like the lab into the into practice. Um, and that's what, you know, and so, and that's because really the genomic technology works, uh, but the logistics are, are equally challenging. And uh, we actually call this uh, the bench to vending machine adventure. Um, and, 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 you know, and so they were, there's a lot of skepticism uh, about, you know, just, just operationalizing a new technology, right? Um, but, um, but, you know, we had UCLA, like the, the nice thing is that even if they weren't sure if we'd be successful, they, uh, they're very supportive in letting us try, right? So uh, they, they, you know, they, they really encouraged us to try, uh, but they really also made it clear that it's us trying and it's not like UCLA Health is trying, right? So we pretty much had a lot of uh, flexibility to kind of do our own thing, um, but it was really kind of on us to do uh, to, to, to do everything. And so fortunately, um, since CGSI was canceled, um, uh, the CTSI staff is really good at logistics, right? So it's actually a lot of the operational, of operationalizing the technology was really done by the CGSI uh, staff and infrastructure in kind of moving forward. So all of the CGSI staff, if you could ask them, they've all worked on this um, at like some point. Um, we, you know, uh, okay, so so how do you uh, bring up a high complexity clear lab? So you need space, you need money, you need forms, lots of things, clinical cut server, like personnel, regulatory compliance. Uh, Valerie, uh, who spoke on Tuesday, is actually uh, also a clinical pathologist, which is kind of the perfect person to kind of be in both uh, uh, worlds. And so we, uh, there was also an institute that they've been planning on building um, that has a had a uh, was you know, had this wet lab space that was empty, so a floor of a building um, on the on the eighth floor of the South Tower, really beautiful. So we have these sequencers with the view, uh, really nice uh, space. So we got this. We, they gave us like one room in this floor. We're now the whole floor, right? Um, um, and um, and so we started kind of going for this, um, and you know then we had these like we we started having meetings with the leadership. And so they, we said, hey, can we buy these sequencers? And they said, sure. Um, you know, well, we need to run two sequencers. They said, sure. And then they said, well, you know, we need a backup so we can get a third sequencer. They said, sure, you know. Because, um, you know, they think that the sequencers will be useful, right? So then at one point we said, well, you know, look, there's like a real run on sample tubes. Um, and if we, you know, we need, uh, we need to buy sample tubes in order to be able to have enough, right, when we do the testing. And uh, the, the vendor says that if we don't buy a million today, then we won't be able to get any, right? Can we buy a million? How much will that cost? Is, you know, $800,000. And they said, let us think about it. So then they came back to it. They said, OK. Um, and so then, um, so, so, you know, <laughs> so we, we start ordering all these things. Uh, they start coming in. And, um, and so I want to kind of give you uh, I, I think it's, it's best to really uh, show how quickly everything moved uh, in a timeline, right? So this is, you know, kind of from, from bench to vending machine, right? From April, the, 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 even just the idea of doing this really started then. Um, you know, by, we validated the technology pretty quickly. Uh, we moved into the new lab. Uh, we submitted the EU uh, FDA approval. Um, we started, you know, working on the automation processes and kind of lab processes, hiring staff, getting all the equipment things come in, and then we only we got our uh, regulatory approval in October, and then we uh, we actually deployed to, our, to UC Santa Barbara, which is our first client in uh, November. Um, and you might ask, like, why is UC Santa Barbara our first testing, even though we're we're at UCLA? Well. That's a, that's a really good, um, good question. And it has to do with um, this regulatory approval. So we actually, um, you know, we developed the technology in, in, you know, in April. And in July, we already did a operational pilot. So the UCLA was testing some, I think, law students coming back to campus. They were testing all of them. And so we collected samples at the same time and showed that we had uh, concordant results. You know, they're, they were all negative, right? So it was pretty easy. Um, but um, so that was July. But then, um, in you know, 
At the time you needed a uh, FDA approval, they actually, at the end of August, they waived that. There was a kind of a fight between the Trump administration and the, uh, and the FDA. So Trump said, you don't have to approve, you can't approve, everything's approved. You don't have to approve anything anymore. Um, but then uh, also you need a, uh, like this CLIA license, right? That, that it's also space dependent, so we had to apply for it. <clears throat> and so it was, un, you know, we applied for this, this in July and September, and we had no idea how long this would take. You know, it's regulatory, right? Um, and so, you know, the campus was uh, every week, we meet with them, are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Oh, no, we're still waiting for the license, we're waiting for the license. For the license. Um, and so on October 22nd, uh, the UCLA campus signed uh, with a vendor to do their testing. And then our license came in like a week later. <laughs> so, so then what was really interesting was that we were no longer able to test for UCLA. Um, and, um, but then UCLA was saying, like, so how much money have you spent on this project so far? Um, and they, they supported us in essentially being able to sell the test to outside uh, groups. And so we then became essentially a vendor, right, uh, working on the UCLA campus. Um, and, but because of that also, the, you know, while, while previously we said we need a third sequence, so they said, sure, you know, anytime we asked for anything else, they were like, you know, pretty much, they, they, were, they were at that point, I think, thinking that it would be a total loss um, of the money. And so they were really trying to limit things. So then we had to figure out how to operate with really limited uh, resources. And so that, um, so we made many ideas on how to do things with very little staff, which actually made a big difference. So for example, um, so we have, because we have few lab staff, um, our lab is, you know, typically, running with like five people, uh, where other labs have, you know, maybe 10 times that or something like that of the same volume. Um, we, we do, we have a process that require, you know, that the idea is that it's made as efficient for the lab as possible. So for example, uh, the, everything's, all the samples are registered and put into these racks at the collection sites. And then they arrive to us. All the lab does is it puts it into a water bath to inactivate it and puts it onto these machines that take the caps off and then, and then uh, these liquid handlers that transfer it to the, to the plates. Um, and so it's really efficient, right, from, from the lab's perspective. Um, and I'll, kinda, I'll give a little bit more, more details there. Um, but then, you know, the other, and other things that we did is that, you know, a lot of, lot of the work in these labs is to transfer samples from the, the samples that they come in from to the samples that, uh, to the, to the, like, the, plates or where they're analyzed. We decided, you know, we didn't have the staff to do that. So we want, had to have the samples that they're collected in be the same ones that are, are used in the lab. So um, this is actually, uh, Val had this, you know, so we had a, one of the things we had to do is for saliva, we needed a device to get somehow the saliva into the, into the tube. There are these, ex these expensive devices you can buy. Like, uh, I don't know if anyone's on a 23andMe kit, they're this whole thing, right? Um, so what, what Val actually realized was, you can buy uh, perfume funnels on Amazon, which, um, which work great, right? And, uh, and so our first initial, we bought 20,000 on Amazon, and, and this is our, our, initial, um, our initial, our test. And if you look at our early, this is one of our early kits, like the funnel looks like a flower, um, and it's, it's exactly because of that, right? Um, since then, we, we then manufactured it. And, um, the, health, the health system wanted a swab, and we also wanted the, you know, we didn't want to change anything. So a lot of times swabs, you need a person in like a biosafety uh, like ca cabinet transferring liquid from where the swab is into, into a plate. And that's also, that's both kind of dangerous. That's like one of the places where you have like the biggest lab safety issues. And we wanted to, to, to have this, you know, not have to do that. So we came up with an idea for our swab is that our swab would break like at the very tip. And so it would still fit into our same tubes, but it would be kind of, if you can see the picture here, it's like below, um, below the, the edge there, so below where the liquid is. So then we could use the same idea, um, but also have a, a swab. So these are things that we had to come up with because um, we just weren't authorized. We couldn't find the staff and we couldn't afford them, but also we weren't authorized to do it, right? So, so many things, so overall, you know, um, the, you know, all our many things like our collection kits are universally interchangeable. The, the, you know, tubes have these 
the, the way that, that things work is that the tubes that we use, they have these uh, barcodes on the side that uh, now, and if you go to, if you do your test at UCLA, a f your phone reads this barcode. And it also has got a barcode on the bottom that matches it. And so um, they're all kind of registered and in the, uh, in the, in the system, you know, a collection. And then when they, when it, the this lab software uh, scans these bottoms, you know, because there's these holes on the bottom of these racks, it's like, it's open. So it scans this uh, when they arrive, and that's how they all kind of get logged in. Um, and so all the samples essentially arrive uh, by, um, by automation that, you know, every, uh, the saliva and the swabs use the, the, the uh, same tubes. So, so let me kind of give some, some how, how things like work. So we have the way things are is that we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, the, like the way it's set up is we think we have these uh, uh, pl plates. These are the kind of, these are 384 well plates. Um, the plates are already prepared ahead of time to have in every well, you have a very speci uh, the specific barcode. And we, ha we have 1530, uh, 1530, it should be 1536 different barcodes. That, and so we have these four plates with 15, th uh, each one has got a, a different barcode in it. And then we, you know, the kind of the way that every kind of sequencing run is, is set up is that we end up with uh, four racks of 96 patient samples that, um, sample tubes that get transferred into each of these plates. So the way that it's set up is that you have these, these four plates, um, you have um, 16 total plates will go into these four plates. Um, and, um, and the way it works is that, you know, when the, when the um, racks arrive in the lab, they get scanned in by this machine that reads all the barcodes and generates a file that looks like this. So it tell, it's basically, it's got, you know, for every position, it's got the, the actual barcode number of the sample. Um, and then, and you know kind of where it is. And then um, you keep track of, um, you know, which rack went where, right? So for, and then, and then, and then also within the plate, you also know what the molecular barcode is kind of at every position. And so you keep track of what went where and then, and then based on that kind of mapping, you can then associate the patient barcode to the molecular barcode. Um, and then when you, when you do the analysis, you look at the number of reads, what the barcodes are, and then you can figure out which, which individual is positive and which one's not. So that's the idea. It's pretty, you know, it, it kind of works, right? It's pretty easy for the lab uh, to do it. Um, but there's all sorts of problems, right? So for example, um, in this system, what would happen if, if, to, if accidentally the lab put the patient rack that was supposed to, you know, 11 and tw these two, they, they flipped them. What would happen if that happened? Yeah, yeah, it'd be like the wrong result for one. So this is like a catastrophic error, right? Um, and, you know, if you imagine that this would happen like 1% of the time, well, you're, you're only sometimes seeing less than 1% positives, right? So it's, it's totally not acceptable. So we had to come up with a way to kind of prevent this. And so the idea is that, you know, we're, we're thinking that, you know, we have sequencing data and so we have digital data. So can we leave a signature in the sequencing data that'll help us, uh, you, know, f uh, you know, figure this out? So the idea is, is that we would leave certain uh, positions empty, right? And then we could then see a signature of, of like these empty positions in, 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 the, pl in, in the plates, right? And so based on that, we could then, um, you know, we could, be, we could basically look to see, you know, where there, there should be empty positions. And if the positions are not empty, then we know that there's an error. And so then, okay, so then how do you, th th okay, so that, that makes sense, right? So then the question is, how do you uh, make sure that you leave the right positions empty at any time? And so then, uh, this is the, in the lab, right? There's this map, right? <laughs> Depending on what time um, of, of day you're doing the, the rack, which positions you leave empty, right? It's kind of a crazy photo. And then uh, they improved on this and they made these uh, 3D printed templates that fit on top of the racks that let them do that. Because, you know, um, so this is the kind of thing that, so I have some uh, pic, uh, videos of the protocol, but I'm gonna kind of skip ahead. So again, so all these things are coming in, you know, here we are. 
Uh, we did testing for not UCLA, UCLA Health, we did the health system, Caltech, uh, UCI Pepperdine, uh, Cal, some Cal States. Uh, and then, you know, and COVID was ending, right? Because it was the, you know, the vaccine was here, uh, everything was dying down. Then, then, then we got this, um, we took over for UCLA and we started, um, you know, uh, testing the vending machines. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we all, uh, and so one of the interesting things is that, you know, we were able to demonstrate, uh, you know, test accuracy in the field. And that's because the health system was also verifying a lot of our positives. And also when people got sick, they went there and then, you know, we would, since we're testing them, you know, if someone got sick and we tested them negative, right, then, then we would know. So we got this feedback. And the other thing that we saw is that there were points where our positivity rate was, you know, 0.1%. So that tell, that kind of gives us a bound on our false positive rate. So we, um, you know, we had a, we, you know, we kind of knew that it was working. Um, and, you know, at UCLA, they set up these, these vending machines with the tests. And, you know, just to give you another perspective, so there's limitless number of problems. So for example, um, with the vending machines, um, the problem, this is the kind of problem that we had to deal with, right? <laughs> So the, uh, people at UCLA might remember this, right? When the, when the test would get stuck in the machines, right? And then uh, people would try to tilt <laughs> the machine, you know, towards them, right? Uh, like, like these video game, they call it video game techniques, right? Like toward them, uh, to, you know, they'd like be teetering, right? Um, um, and, and so, you know, then they try to make the thing smaller, all this kind of stuff, right? And then so, and this actually was solved by them. So the solution um, is that they put candy in in the machines, which like so now the the tests have candy in them, which which is really as a weight, right? It's not it's not for uh, for for anything else, right? Yeah. So so but then it made all the saliva some saliva green and red and then, yeah, it was, yeah, it was kind of funny, right? Yeah. So. Um, so then the other thing that happened too is that we ended up getting, you know, we, we like, so, so the thing is, you know, we have this new technology. It's kind of, you know, we're, we're just starting to test for UCLA. Like, you know, we kind of under the radar, but somehow we got uh, the government had this program where they invested like $400 million into co uh, COVID testing technologies. And most, many of them didn't really, de are still not deployed, right? Um, because, you know, it's, it's actually involves a lot of luck. Like we had a lot of luck. And so then we, we actually got, connected to them and then we ended up being added to their program and they invested in our program to really build out our facility with with automation and so we ended up buying all this um, all this equipment um, actually uh, maybe I'm gonna kind of skip ahead oh this is actually what it what our what our new version looks like you know and so we have all this uh, automated equipment uh, doing that doing the test um, this is a little sped up a little bit but um, you know but you, you get the idea right of it do, uh, basically uh, doing the, this is it, it, tr it transferring into the place. So anyways, this is the kind of what it's, what it's uh, doing. Um, and, and of course, you know, when we thought that, um, so we thought that COVID was over, but then, uh, and we got this money, we we're like, oh, we're going to build a genome center. This would be really great. Um, we're going to, you know, and, but then what happened was that the Delta variant came, right? And, um, and then, and we were maybe doing like two, 3,000 a day, and we thought that that's kind of what we would be at. Then the Delta variant came, and there's this big spike, and then the UCLA and other universities decided to test everybody on the campus coming in, right? So we're, we're like, well, we just, you know, we just got this, this government contract. We're going to get all this uh, equipment. Well, that'll help us, you know, doing the, the thing, right? So this is the plan. We were about nine, uh, 3,000 a day, just in time. We would get all this equipment. And we would move to twelve thousand a day, and that would let us do the move in, and then uh, and then you know uh, kind of right. But the problem was is that the the, the contract was signed late, and that we, we we went to order the equipment. And said, oh, okay, it'll be there in three months, right? So the equipment was only going to arrive in November, but we we had to test everybody. So we had to actually come up with uh, ways to um, to increase our capacity with just what we had. And, um, and so one of the things that actually our, our lab manager, Rachel Young, she's really phenomenal. She figured out a way to get six sequencing runs done a day, which kind of got us up to uh, 9,000 uh, uh, tests a day, which is, um, you know, really well. But then, but then like, and we were running at that for, for weeks. 
but that's really unsustainable. Um, and so we actually uh, did something else, which is, so if you recall, the primers have, uh, have, um, have a bar, you know, the primers themselves, they, they have the barcodes, they have both a forward and reverse primer, and it's, and it's called a unique dual indexing in the sense that both sides are, are unique. That's important for, sometimes you have template switching where you might have, a, you know, like a, an issue like that. But in general, um, you know, th that's, why, that's why they were designed that way. So we had uh, 1536 uh, samples uh, per run. Um, but, you know, in, and this was like, really, we had to do this because of, you know, the, it was just not sustainable running that much, you know, that many uh, uh, samples. So what we did was we, 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 we actually kind of, in this crazy period, we uh, developed, you know, we kind of did, we developed a strategy of combinatorial indexing where we would mix the forward and reverse primers um, into, into different ways. Um, and you can actually then get up to, um, you know, 6,000, uh, you know, over 6,000 samples because there's four different combinations. You can actually do more, but the actual primers are on plates themselves. And so you just mix them in a different order. I mean, you could do more, but it would be more work uh, to do that. Um, and, um, and so this is actually, then once we did this, we're actually able to incorporate that and then basically let the lab be able to run a capacity, but without at the, at the, the now we actually are able to do almost like 6,000, um, in one run, which is great because the lab has a much easier life. The only problem is, is that if that fails, there's a lot of, lot of unhappy, unhappy people. But so this is actually, this is, these are showing, each one of these is like a different run and you can see like how many, you know, this is like, we're, some days we're doing like seven, imagine doing, I mean, how many people are here have done one library prep, right? Imagine doing like uh, seven in one day, right? It's a lot, right? So, um, so um, anyways, but, but it, 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 it was kind of the idea. And so then, so since that time, you know, with Omicron and things like that, We've been pretty much running at, you know, I think UCLA had almost full, um, uh, full, um, you know, kind of um, mandated testing for almost the whole year. And so now we're, um, now we're, we're here. So just, you know, um, there's actually, uh, one of the things that, you know, is kind of interesting also is that, um, you know, we've collected a huge amount of data, right, from this with all the tests. And so one of the interesting things you could do is that you could look at the data and say, well, could you do things differently based on, on the data? So for example, one, one issue that we have is, is, uh, is here. So for example, um, you know, oftentimes, because you know, the, the biggest, so we're, you know, we're using, our test is a saliva test, and um, it's, you know, it, we, we heat and activate it. So we heat it for 95 at 95 degrees for 30 minutes, and then we process it. And so that kind of breaks down a lot of the PCR inhibition, right? But, you know, what's in your saliva really depends on many, first of all, heterogeneity among individuals and what's, you know, the day. So sometimes you have something in there that just prevents uh, PCR from happening. And so then, you know, th those samples just, you know, there's much less uh, amplification. So many fewer reads, right? And so oftentimes you'll, you'll be below this 500 reads threshold for that. And that happens a lot, um, you know, maybe like a few percent of the samples per day. But we wondered, well, like, what if you have, let's say only 200, but you have zero of the, it's all the spike reads, zero of the reads, right? Um, you know, like, would that, are those negatives, right? You know, are those negatives or not? A priori, there's no way to tell, right? But because we would rerun all of the ones that we tested, we can look kind of historically and say, okay, well, what if we try this rule? If, if you only had 100, but the spikes, the actual real target was zero, then what ha would happen if you just went this way instead of inconclusive, right? And so then we saw like out of like 16,000, you know, sa samples in that three month period that we looked at, um, only like seven would have been, you know, positive, right? And that's like way below our kind of error rate. So then we said, okay, so we could do that. So that kind of reduced the amount of um, inconclusives by maybe a, a third or a half or something like that. So th these are the kinds of things. You know, I, I, I started with SRIRAM, you know, the other day we're like, maybe we could look at PCA and other things that, you know, we have maybe 15, 
you know, 1.5 million samples, but also maybe hundreds of sequencing runs. Maybe there's some information in the runs you can look at to do that. So we're just we're just starting. So, anyways, um, you know, Kona, what's next? So, I think you know our goal, and this is really you know our goal was really to develop an accurate, scalable uh, $10 PCR test, which we you know when when we told people in um, in, uh, in in 2020 that we wanted to do this. I mean, they literally some of, they laughed at us, right? Um, but you know we did it. I think it's you know uh, it's we really did it. Um, it's it's we charged 20, but it could be 10 if if people bought enough of them. It would be 10. Um, so um, and you know so the next steps. I think the next you know we've talked about doing many different things, um, but I think that what we're very interested in is developing a test which would really be kind of a metagenomics test. So instead of um, um, amplifying. Uh, you know, a target, we would just deplete and sequence, right? Because in our test, the sequencing costs are basically zero because the sequencers are so efficient. In this, the sequencing cost would be more, but it still could potentially be affordable, uh, but it would find everything, right? So, um, you know, some of the, you know, Ryan's talk, you know, we, maybe we'll use that, that uh, uh, you know, we'll use your uh, uh, library of sequences, right? So that's, that's I think that's what the, ne the next steps are. Um, and you know, again, this is a real um, major uh, collaboration, and particularly a very uh, interesting collaboration between the clinical staff and the staff that have had a lot of experience in the clinical labs. And we learned a lot from them, like the genomics scientists, right? And then they also hopefully learned and put up with us. Uh, but it was a real collaboration of like learning how to do like the tracking of the samples and the sequencing, and then working that into a clinical workflow, right? I think that's something that these worlds are so f typically far apart, they're really, there's not that kind of collaboration. And then again, you know, the, the core faculty, um, you probably recognize a lot of the uh, CGSI uh, related, um, the related, uh, per, um, you know, people here. Um, and then, yeah, we have, you know, we, our, our paper on the sequencing technology is out. Okay, yeah, thank you.